Hello and welcome to another episode of Podcast DX, the show that brings you interviews with people just like you whose lives were forever changed by a medical diagnosis. I'm Lita. I'm Ron. And I'm Jean Marie. Collectively, we're the hosts of Podcast DX. On today's show, we are talking about ticks and tick-borne diseases with Dr. Richard Horowitz. Dr. Richard Horowitz is a board-certified internist in private practice in Hyde Park, New York. He is the medical director at Hudson Valley Healing Arts Center and Integrative Medical Center, which combines both classical and complementary approaches in the treatment of Lyme disease and other tick-borne disorders. Dr. Horowitz has treated over 12,000 chronic Lyme disease patients in the last 29 years, with some of his patients coming from not only the U.S., but Canada and Europe. Wow. Well, Dr. Horowitz, thank you for taking the time to speak with us today. Before we get into the discussion about these vectors and how they affect people, is the problem worse for our pets more than humans? You know, it's a, it is a problem for pets. In fact, dogs, which are humanity's best friend, and I'm certainly a great dog lover, are usually sentinels of Lyme disease because a lot of times the veterinarians in the area will discover that they have more of a tick problem with Lyme disease, Ehrlichia, Anaplasma, Babesia. All of the tick-borne diseases that we're seeing in humans can be uh, had by all of your pets. So in fact, it is a big problem for pets and pet owners need to really pay attention to it. Okay. And, and one thing I'm always cognizant of when we bring our pets back from a walk is the fact that if they do have a tick on them, that tick could just as easily leave them and hop on over to me. So we, um, we, we try to be careful about that too. Right. Yeah. And Dr. Horowitz, uh, what are some of the most common tick-borne diseases? I know you just listed a few, but are those the most common diseases found here in the United States? And is it different for different climates? So um, in the United States, we have a couple of different ticks. Um, mm -hmm. Ixodes scapularis is on the East Coast, Ixodes pacificus on the Pacific Coast in California. Uh, there are some ticks in the middle of the country. And the Lone Star Tick, for example, which used to be in Texas years ago, is now on the East Coast. It's all the way from Long Island all the way up to Maine uh, with Haemophilus longicornis, which is a new tick that arrived just a couple of years ago. This is the Asian bush oh, tick. Right, right. Okay. That, that arrived a couple of years ago. So what we're starting to see is an expansion of tick-borne diseases, different ticks, different diseases in the United States. So Lyme disease is by far the most common, but after Lyme disease, you're seeing a fair number of cases of ehrlichiosis and anaplasmosis. Most of my patients who get diagnosed with Lyme have babesiosis, which is a malaria-like organism. Mm -hmm. uh, it usually makes the Lyme disease three times worse. Oh. We are seeing Bartonella, mm -hmm. which is at this point still being debated as to whether it is a tick-borne infection, but it is showing up in a lot of these chronically ill Lyme patients. And then if you look at the Lone Star tick, it contains something that I referred to with mnemonic tears, tularemia, Ehrlichia, alpha gal allergy, star eye, southern tick associated rash like illness. Um, so you're dealing with a lot of different tick borne diseases that are now showing up, and people really need to be paying a lot of attention to it, including, of course, the Powassan virus, which can get in within 15 minutes of a tick bite, and roughly 10% of people who get neurological involvement can die from it. So it's oh. very serious, oh. and people need to pay attention. Oh. Wow, yeah. I never heard of that one. No, and I guess. Um, I, I, I don't know. We're kind of, um, uh, well, I was going to say we're like ethnocentric and and um, we're, we kind of centralize our discussions on the U.S., but I was also surprised to learn that there are ticks like everywhere. Um, so even if you've been on a trip and you come back, you need to be cognizant of the fact that there were, you know, there could be ticks anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, but thank you. I, I'm glad you had to say what all the ticks were called and all of the diseases <laughs> We didn't as have well. to say, We yes. didn't have to read those. Yes. Yes. I think Ron has a couple of questions about oh, that. Oh, yeah. I thought we were going to, okay. Well, I had one question. Sure. How common are tick-borne diseases here in the U.S.? Oh, and I guess, and are, are they on the rise? So the CDC reported last year that we had almost uh, a half a million cases. The number, I think, was 476,000. And those are the number of cases of Lyme disease that we know about. Mm -hmm. There are other species of Borrelia, uh, Borrelia miyamotoi, for example, is called hard tick relapsing fever. And this is a cousin of Borrelia burgdorferi, which is a relapsing fever Borrelia. So the problem is, for example, that most people, when they think about Lyme disease, 
they think about getting an erythema migrans rash, which mm -hmm. is the typical bullseye rash. Half of them look like bullseyes, half of them look like a spreading rash, which could be misdiagnosed as a cellulitis, as a oh. spider bite, oh. as herpes zoster. But Borrelia miyamotoid disease can still cause, for example, fevers and joint aches and fatigue and even a meningitis, which affects your central nervous system, and the Lyme testing will not be positive. So people need to understand that even with these other species of Borrelia, that the two-tiered testing that a lot of the doctors use may not be accurate in picking them all up. Oh, okay. That's very good to know. Right. Okay. And, and I, you don't know me, <laughs> but let me introduce you. I am a climate crazy person. I am so involved in climate change and the problems that it's it's causing. And this is another way that climate change is causing problems, isn't it? Yeah, so the, the climate is directly impacting the number of tick-borne diseases. Uh, what Rick Osfeld showed from the Institute of Ecosystem Studies is that the ticks are coming out three weeks earlier because of climate change. So although May is normally considered to be Lyme Awareness Month, uh, some have actually considered moving it down to April because the ticks are coming out earlier. And as I said, they're, they're increasing in number. So the problem is, as the climate warms up, these ticks and mosquitoes and fleas, their reproductive rates are directly related to the environmental temperature. So as it gets warmer outside, these vector-borne diseases are getting worse and worse. So 17%, right? 17% of all global infectious disease are vector-borne disease. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing an increase in it year by year. So whether it's mosquitoes, whether it's Zika, dengue fever, um, chicken gunga virus, they're all of these different viruses that are now showing up. We're also seeing a rise in that and in fleaborne illness like Bartonella. So yes, it's, it's getting worse as the climate is heating up and people really need to pay a lot of attention. And the one thing I think that people don't even realize as we're getting over the pandemic with COVID, I mean, we're in our sixth wave right now, is that in the permafrost, as it's melting in the Arctic, there are viable bacteria viruses and fungi that exist in the permafrost and humanity has no immunity against these viruses, bacteria and fungi. They've been hidden from humanity's immune system for hundreds of thousands to millions of years. So as these bacteria, viruses and fungi are released from the Arctic melting permafrost and get up into the stratosphere, they can come to North America and cause new pandemics. And this is a danger of climate change that I don't think most people are aware of at this point. In time. Wow! Right. No, yeah, I right. was not. <laughs> yeah, right. that's that is. Yeah, it it really it it really does hit you right in the face when you realize it. Uh, we got to make changes. Right. And although I'm familiar with bacterial infections caused by uh, ticks, I was surprised to read that some viruses and parasites can also be transmitted by ticks. So there's a couple of viruses. The most common ones we're seeing at this point in the US is the heartland virus, the bourbon virus, and the Powassan virus. Those are the three most common ones. But, but there are some in Europe, for example, Com Congo Crimean hemorrhagic fever, um, which is a really, it's a deadly infection where you can actually bleed out. This virus has been coming from ticks now in Spain and parts of Europe for a while. We've not seen cases here in the US that I'm aware of, but the heartland virus and the bourbon virus it looks like Ehrlichia anaplasma. So for example, uh, most of the people getting it at this point are in the Midwest, in the Missouri area, but you can get what looks like Ehrlichia, low white cell counts, low platelet counts, elevated liver functions, uh, high fevers, headaches, fatigue, muscle aches. You feel very ill and it looks like Ehrlichia anaplasma. You give them doxycycline, which normally will cure Ehrlichia anaplasma at an early stage, but these viruses are resistant to doxycycline. There's no cure and people die from these viruses. It's the same with Powassan virus. We do not have at this point a viable treatment for Powassan. Fortunately, most people don't get the neurological complications of Powassan as a virus, but about 10% of those who get neuroinvasive disease will die from it. So those are three most common viruses at this point that are spreading and the parasite Babesia, I mean, that's common. Most of the doctors in the US are seeing patients with Lyme and Babesia at the same time because the ticks are transmitting these two infections simultaneously in many patients. Oh, I, you know, I never thought about that. So you, one tick can bring you many gifts. <laughs> Absolutely, you can get with one tick bite, Lyme disease, heart tick relapsing fever, Borrelia miyamotoi, uh, anaplasma, uh, Powassan virus, Babesia, all of these are possible with one <laughs> tick bite. and. 
Oh. You know, the ticks are so small, right? At, at this time of the year when the ticks are still in the nymph mm -hmm. stage and even you'll, you'll even see with some of the, um, the smaller ones, just as they're coming out below the nymph stage, when you're looking at larvae. Mm -hmm. So normally we don't think as the larvae is actually being infectious, but they've shown with this hard tick relapsing fever, Borrelia miyamotoi, that the mother tick will transmit this Borrelia directly to the offspring. They don't even need a blood meal. So you could be walking through the forest and get 500 or 1,000 of these larvae on your skin. You can get this at about, it's about a 1% transmission rate, and you will never even see the transmitting agent because the larvae are so small, they're like a pinhead. Wow. I, I think you just <laughs> oh, terrified wow. us, and now yeah, no I, one I, wants to go back out into the forest. Actually, <laughs> my next question was going to be about prevention. But okay. yeah, I. Uh, it makes me want to think twice yeah, about yeah. doing stuff a lot outside. Of things, right. Well, let's. Yeah. I, I guess go we ahead. really do need to know about prevention. Yeah, yeah go yeah, ahead. Yeah. So um, that leads into being outside. For me personally, I like to be outside, be in nature, uh, take walks. Um, I shoot archery on a 3D range, so we're you know out um, a lot of trees and all that. There's products on the market to help. They claim, they claim that they help keep the ticks from getting on the skin. Do you know, are there any products that can be infused into the clothing itself that repel ticks? And what about any clothes that are, I don't know, cinched so tightly around your ankles and wrists so that you won't get a tick bite? Or like shoe gaiters. Right. So there, there are um, permethrin treating clothing. So permethrin, it's a derivative of the chrysanthemum. And they, you can spray your clothing or you can buy clothing that is impregnated with permethrin and those will kill ticks. What I usually suggest for the skin is there are several products. The one I use when I go outside and I garden or I take walks because uh, the mosquitoes love me because I, I schwitz a lot. I'm, I put out a lot of carbon dioxide and heat, which is where the mosquitoes and ticks like to go. Mm -hmm. um, I use picaridin 20%. And I found that 5%, 10%, at least for me, it's not enough. They still come after me with the mosquitoes. But 20% picaridin I find is effective. Uh, for children or pregnant women, mm -hmm. there is a product called IR3535, which is an amino acid base. It's completely safe in pregnancy. They've used it in Europe for over 35 years, even in pregnancy. Avon Skin So Soft makes it. I've tried it personally. I don't find it to be quite as effective for the mosquitoes, but it's possible for the ticks. It's fine. Um, I don't usually prescribe DEET for people simply because there were some earlier studies in children that it may have had some toxic effects uh, with seizure disorders, although I've oh, certainly wow. never seen it. Mm -hmm. uh, for deep woods, I think DEET may be appropriate for people. But the real trick at this point is you've got to be doing regular tick checks. But if you're using, for example, permethrin treated clothing and pick a ride in 20%. There's a new product that will be coming out soon from the CDC. They have a patent on it called Nucatone. It's a citrus-based grapefruit smelling kind of citrus extract. Mm -hmm. It's been shown to be highly effective against ticks and mosquitoes. Um, the, you've, you've actually probably consumed it over the years. It's in Fresca and certain products that have been allowed on the market. It looks like it's gonna be a very effective product as a soap oh. that people can shower with or bathe with before they even go outside. But They've yet to release it uh, globally, but it's something that will be coming down the pike to protect people. Thank you. I wonder if um, they'll do any, you know, clin I, don't, I guess it's already clinical, passed clinical, clinical tests, studies but um, the for military? the military, right. yes, because um, it seems like when you're in the in the military and on the ground, you're highly susceptible to getting ticks. G Jean Marie and I were both in the, well, the, uh, the national guard. The military guard. have a they have a really tough time. Yeah. Yeah. The military. If you look around the military bases around the U.S., mm -hmm. uh, Pat Smith from the LDA looked at these studies years ago. The military at a, are a high risk, and actually, the the military do have permethrin treated clothing uh, that they use. They even have Pat. Pat told me about this years ago. They have infrared goggles when they're out doing their training exercises that are connected to satellites that they can see the tick populations oh, wow. as they're going forward in the brush to be able to tell people what to avoid. I mean, not, with the climate going on, I don't think we're going to be wearing infrared goggles mm -hmm. to avoid them in the future, but the military does have this technology. Okay. Good to know. Good to know. Good yes. to know. Um, so I have a, a question for my friends in the other room that enjoy camping and hiking. How do you do a tick check after coming in from your outing? 
Um, if you don't find any on the first time that you check, do you have to recheck the next day? What's the what's the protocol? protocol? You certainly could check the next day. It's, it's actually not a bad idea because sometimes with the NIMS, as I said, they're so small, you may miss them. The, the recommendations, if people will do it, and I don't think most people really stay on top of this, is when you come inside, if you've been out in areas uh, that are highly endemic, which at this point, honestly, is, is the whole United States. In every, it's in every state. Um, they've even found ticks, by the way, on penguins in Antarctica, if you'd like to know oh. how far this one's gone. Wow. Um, I used to joke with Pat about that, but she then sent me a picture of it. So if you put your clothes in the dryer at a high heat, for anywhere between 10 or 15 minutes when you come inside, that high heat uh, will dehydrate the ticks and kill them. It's good to take a shower. You need to check yourself in places you, that the ticks usually like to go, like in back of the knee, in the groin, under the arm, um, in the hairline. Those are the kind of places you really need to be checking. And if you have a partner, it's certainly good to have them check in places that you can't see, but you do need to do a full body check and certainly taking a shower when you come indoors and checking is, is a good way to make sure that you've not been uh, affected by a tick. Thank you. Great, yeah, great advice. Good advice. And if I do find a tick, should I remove it myself or should I ask a healthcare pro professional to do it for me? And if I remove it myself, should I save it? Yes. Yeah, so it, it, you don't need a healthcare professional to remove a tick. The only time you might is when the ticks start burrowing and embedding in the skin, it can be difficult to get them out. Uh, they use a cement-like substance to burrow into the skin and they're difficult to remove. And then sometimes you need a healthcare provider with a really good tweezer to pull, but sometimes even the head stays in after you pull them out. The, the trick is to use a fine tip tweezer to get to the area right where the tick is attaching at the skin and pull straight up. They do have tick removal devices. I carry one on me at all times. Um, they almost look like a little device, almost like a fork that you get underneath the tick and you can pull straight out. So I carry that with me on my keychain at all times. There's even devices that are like corkscrews because the tick uses its, um, when it gets into the skin, it almost burrs in like a, like a cork. So there are devices that you can use, but the trick is do not squeeze the tick. Mm -hmm. Do not use a match. Do not use Vaseline, gasoline, chemicals, because then what will happen, the tick will regurgitate whatever it has in the salivary glands, which if it's partially fed, you know, there's this theory that it takes 24 hours to be able to transmit Lyme disease. And I would say that can be true, but there are scientific studies that within six hours or less, you can transmit it. And the reason why is because if a tick has partially fed on another animal and it has the spirochetes or viruses or, or for example, Babesia in the salivary glands, when you then get bit by that tick, it will transmit it uh, within a much shorter period of time. So you, you want to get under the tick, pull it straight out, don't squeeze it. If you do mm -hmm. think you've improperly treated it um, or pulled it out, you may want to speak to your healthcare provider. Uh, and certainly if the tick is engorged, if it's been on for at least 48 hours or longer, it's going to look kind of grayish and large. And at that point, you really should be on prophylactic antibiotic with some doxycycline. What I like to tell providers is that uh, the CDC really highlights this. They used to say to people, don't give tetracyclines to kids, pregnant women, because of the risk of teeth staining. That was only true with the older tetracyclines. Doxycycline does not stain the teeth. And you can give seven or 10 days of doxycycline to a child below eight years old, or even to a pregnant woman, because there are kids that have died from Rocky Mountain spotted fever in the United States because the pediatricians were afraid to give them doxycycline after a tick bite, and you've got to get the tetracycline in within the first six or seven days, or you can die from rickettsial infections like Rocky Mountain spotted fever. So, so keep in mind that doxycycline prophylactically, if a tick has been on long enough and you're suspecting it, you can't wait for the antibody test for things like anaplasma or lichia, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, which all have the same biological characteristics, by the way, of high fevers, muscle aches, joint aches, uh, headaches, you're gonna get kind of the same clinical presentations with a low white cell count and or a low platelet count and or elevated liver functions. If you get any of that presentation with those biological characteristics on a CBC or a biochem profile, you wanna give a short course of doxy just to make sure that you're knocking this out early. Okay, okay. and All I right. think that, that answers, yeah, Ron's a question, question we had too. Right. Um, is there a, like a governing body or an agency that uh, monitors 
tick-borne illnesses and will, you know, so that you know there's an increased risk in your specific area? The CDC has a website. And if you go on the CDC website, I've, I've worked for uh, HHS. I was on the first round of the tick-borne disease working group mm -hmm. where they show seven people from the public that worked with seven members of government, which was the CDC, the FDA, the NIH, and the Department of Defense. Okay. So I, I worked with them back in 2017, 2018. And if you go on the CDC website mm -hmm. and you look up your specific state, you should be able to find that information. Okay. Um, they're doing uh, surveillance criteria on a regular basis, and they have centers of excellence in Maine and other parts of the US where they're monitoring the ticks and how the tick populations are changing over time. So. Yes, that information is available, but keep in mind, uh, they don't ever really have enough money from a screening perspective to do this every year. Mm -hmm. if, for example, in New York, they estimate the cases of tick-borne diseases because they don't have the money to be able to screen it on a regular basis. Um, although the University of Albany and certain other uh, Binghamton, they're doing some surveillance criteria, but just know that, yes, you can find it, but it's probably gonna be higher than whatever you're seeing at this point on the websites. Okay. 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 And I guess it's good to note that um, just because you're not walking into the forest and you're staying in you know your own backyard, if wildlife is coming into your backyard, like raccoons, deer, squirrels, squirrels birds. mice, any yes, they can be dropping off ticks right at your back door. Um, literally, literally, yes. Yeah. So you have to. Um, everyone needs to be a little cautious. Absolutely. And, you know, normally ticks will come after you when you're like anywhere between 12 to 15 feet away. They will smell your carbon dioxide and your heat signature. But the Lone Star tick mm -hmm. is extremely aggressive. Oh. And if it smells you from up to 50 feet away, it will come running. So even if you're not in necessarily <laughs> high grass and you have an area where those ticks are located, they will come after you. Uh, even if you think, oh, I didn't walk in the woods, I didn't mm -hmm. walk in high grass. So, yes, you've got to be very careful with it. Okay. Make me not want to go outside anymore. That is my new scary movie. <laughs> <laughs> the ticks are coming after me. Um, what is the uh, best? By, by the way, regarding that, there, there are a few documentaries that have recently come out. One of them, The Monster Inside of Me. I was just in uh, Connecticut a few weeks ago looking at the screening. Uh, it, it's a very good Lyme documentary that came out. Um, the Lyme Trials, it used to be the old name of it, but um, the Invisible Illness, that's another one that has just recently come out. There's, there's a bunch of good Lyme documentaries that have come out. Under Our Skin was one of the first ones from years ago. Mm -hmm. But look, it, it is scary. It's not to say you can't go outdoors and enjoy the outdoors, but I don't think most people realize that the risk is becoming higher and higher as the world is heating up with climate change. So I have a permethrin spray bottle, um, sorry, a picaridin spray bottle before I go outside and I garden or I take a walk, mm -hmm. I'm spraying myself before I go out to make sure that I always have something to put on my skin on a regular basis because otherwise I might forget, take a walk outside. And at that point, the mosquitoes are attacking me. I, 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 I just have to be very careful because I'm a tick and mosquito magnet. Okay, so that's the best way of avoiding contracting a tick-borne illness is to spray yourself down before you go out? I, I like, personally, I like the picaridin 20%. I find that it's it's effective. And as I said, when Nucatone and others come out, I will probably be using them. But, um, you know, and if you have permethrin treated clothing, absolutely use it. It is it is highly effective. I think if once you get Lyme disease, you've gotten these diseases, you realize that prevention is so important. Mm -hmm. But until you get it, I just posted something on my Facebook page this morning. It's uh, Dr. Period Richard Horowitz. If people want to keep up with you know what's going on with tick-borne diseases uh, and the climate, um, but but I don't think people realize like there was an article I published this morning on Canada Canadian health authorities were telling people you know not to really worry that much about Lyme disease, even though it's spreading throughout Canada, and it's like. There's nothing that could be further from the truth. And what I, the end quote I put is, until you get it, you don't get it, which is once you get sick from this disease or from other tick-borne illness, you realize how severe this is and that prevention is the key. Right. And especially as the climate is warming up, you must consider doing this because it can even be life-threatening. There are people that have died from Lyme carditis, from Powassan encephalitis, uh, from anaplasmosis. The death rate can be up to 3%. Rickettsial diseases, people die from Rocky Mountain spotted fever. You must protect yourself. Very, very important. Okay. okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, what about uh, for people with pets? Are there things that you recommend? Um, and what about lawn treatment? Are those good preventative measures? 
you should speak to your vet about it. My, my you know, I'm a big dog person and my wife and I are looking at now at adopting a dog. Uh, we're probably going to be going to the rescue soon. And I told my wife, the only kind of animal dog I would get at this point is a short hair where I can check for ticks. But, you know, they've got at this point, they've got a Lyme vaccine for the dogs that is quite effective. Uh, so you could speak to the a vet about that. They do have sprays that you can put on the dog, which are effective. I One of my patients just brought in this this beautiful large Bernese uh, mountain dog just a couple of days ago that they were spraying. They said it's quite effective. The, the Soresto collar and a couple, I think a couple of those, there've recently been some reports in the, t in the pets that you have to be careful about some of the side effects, but I would speak to your vet about that because there are effective prevention methods. But as you said earlier, one of the problems is that the tick can come inside on your animal and then just jump off. So if you happen to sleep with your dog, like I used to years ago when I was a kid, it's gonna put you at higher risk for getting it. So uh, definitely speak to the vet about all the new prevention practices that are out there. Good idea. Oh, yeah, yes. yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and what treatments are there available to treat tick-borne diseases? So there are some newer treatment for tick-borne diseases. And for example, my wife who was sick for about 25, 30 years, and this mm -hmm. is years actually before she met me, she didn't realize that you know her diagnosis of chronic fatigue syndrome uh, myalgic encephalomyelitis, fibromyalgia was due to Lyme and what I call Lyme MSIDS. She had up to 16 different reasons why she was ill. Mm -hmm. My wife is now three and a half years in remission, complete oh. remission since she did an eight week oral generic antibiotic protocol known as the double dose dapsone combination therapy. And I published this protocol in the journal Antibiotics with Dr. Phyllis Freeman back in 2020, two years ago. And I discovered this protocol after about seven years ago, John Hopkins researchers had talked about Lyme disease being a persister bacteria. Now, those of us in medicine knew, who've been doing this for a long time, knew that Borrelia burgdorferi, the agent of Lyme disease, persists. That was really not the issue. But I had never thought of Borrelia being a persister bacteria the way mycobacteria tuberculosis or leprosy is. So when Ying Zhang and other researchers from John Hopkins and Stanford University, the University of New Haven, Kim Lewis, all these researchers started coming out talking about biofilm and persister forms of Lyme disease. So I looked up some of these mycobacterium drugs that I had used in residency over 30 years ago when I was seeing uh, the AIDS population during that particular epidemic. And I looked at Dapsone. And Dapsone is a drug that is used to treat leprosy with rifampin. And I looked at the qualities of the drug. It's an oral generic drug, gets excellent penetration into the central nervous system. It hits persister forms, it's anti-inflammatory, and it hits malarial organisms like Babesia. So I decided to try it, adding doxycycline to rifampin dapsone, which they use to treat leprosy. And I figured out over time that if you increase the dose of dapsone from the usual dose of 100 milligrams to 200 milligrams, and you do this for a month while you're working up the dose of Dapsone, I will get approximately a 50% long-term remission rate for one year or longer, as long as all of the MSIDS variables are addressed. So what am I referring to with the MSIDS variables? If you read any of my prior books, Why Can't I Get Better? Back in 2013, this came out from St. Martin's Press. It was a New York Times bestseller. Or my last book, How Can I Get Better? from St. Martin's Press in 2017, it describes a 16 point map that if you're sick with Lyme, you wanna go through these 16 points in detail to figure out where the multiple sources of inflammation are coming from and what are the downstream effects of the inflammation. So what are the, the causes of inflammation? Well, for most people, it's Lyme, Babesia, and Bartonella as probably the most common infections. Followed by that, if the microbiome of your gut is off, and you happen to have leaky gut and food allergies with mast cell disorder, or you're a Lyme patient that doesn't fall asleep, or you're mineral deficient in zinc, or you have heavy metals like mercury, lead, arsenic, or mold toxins. All of these different things will cause an inflammatory response in the body. And the reason that people get sick from Lyme and tick-borne is from inflammation. So you've got to address all the underlying sources of inflammation, and you've got to address what this inflammation is doing to the body which is causing POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, low blood pressure, or it's causing mitochondrial dysfunction. The parts of your cells that make energy get damaged by this high levels of free radical oxidative stress, 
or the hormones are affected. Men come in with low testosterone. Over 90% have low adrenal function. It's a map to take a look and see where is the inflammation coming from? How do I address it? But if you work the 16-point MSIDS model with your provider and you use double-dose dapsone combination therapy with a new treatment that I just put in the literature four weeks ago, which is a four-day high-dose pulse of dapsone at 400 milligrams, it's still going through peer review, uh, but you, there's a preprint, you can look it up and you'll find it. We're finding that those patients with Babesia and Bartonella that failed the double-dose dapsone, in other words, the 50% that did not go into long-term mm -hmm. remission, about a third of those patients with a four-day course of high-dose oral antibiotics got better. Okay. So we're, we're now at about a two-thirds response rate with about nine weeks of an oral generic antibiotic regimen where I don't have to use IV anymore mm -hmm. and people are getting better. So it's re we're really moving along and finding solutions. The Lyme community should have a lot of hope like listening to this because mm -hmm. we're, we're progressing very quickly finding long-term solutions. That's Excellent. wonderful. Yeah, that's Excellent. great. Good Doc news. Yeah, absolutely. Dr. Horowitz, what actually drove your interest to get into medicine? Because you are really into this. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. What, what, what got you started? Well, you know, it, it, it's an old joke, but since you know my last name is Horowitz, you should know that when you come from a Jewish lineage, you only have two possibilities growing up. You're either going to be a doctor or a lawyer. <laughs> I, make joke, I make jokes about that, but when I went to Northwestern University and I was doing not only pre-med with biology, but I was also doing theater and music, uh, along with philosophy, psychology and everything, I really wanted to go into theater and music because I enjoyed the arts. And my mother said to me, listen, you're going to benefit the world much more as a doctor. I grew up with a doctor in my family. So she said, why don't you become a doctor and do theater and music on the side? Mm -hmm. So once I got out of med school um, and I did my residency down at Mount Sinai in New York City, I moved to the Hudson Valley, New York, which was mm -hmm. about two hours north of New York City. And I moved into the largest Lyme endemic area of the oh. United States at that point back in 1987. So it's not that I was looking to specialize in Lyme disease. Mm -hmm. I just happened to have moved into a gotcha. highly Lyme endemic area and patients were coming in with bullseye rashes, you know, 70, 80% would get better. But the 20, 30% that didn't get better, you know, I had taken a vow in medicine to put myself in people's shoes and do for them as if I was treating myself or my wife, right? You exchange right. Mm -hmm. yourself with others, do for them what you would want done for yourself. And that started me on a healing journey of trying to figure out why these people were sick. And 35 years later, truthfully, I'm, I'm very close to a long-term durable solution. Next year, I hope to be able to do a randomized controlled trial where we prove that dapsone combination therapy with the MSIDS model is gonna be a really good viable solution for this epidemic of Lyme and tick-borne that's going on across the world. Okay. Great, okay. Dr. Horowitz, I think your mom was right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> ben, thank you for all your research and all your time doing this. I think it has helped quite a bit. Yeah, right. Absolutely. And why have you decided to go into integrated medicine? How has that role come into play or that particular field. So, you know, cl classical medicine, honestly, it's wonderful. And the thing about the advantage I had going to the Free University of Brussels in Belgium, where I did medicine for seven years in French, and that was that was quite a wow. that was quite an experience. Mm -hmm. um, their medical school there is much more extensive and detailed than we get here in the United States. It's a seven year program. Okay. So in Belgium, for example, I got two years of biochemistry and nutritional biochemistry, two years of anatomy, a year of dermatology, a year of ear, nose, and throat, right? Mm -hmm. um, multiple years of cardiology, et cetera. So by the time I got to the US and I did my training here mm -hmm. and I was going through my internal medicine residency, I had already had a lot of hospital experience and had learned differential diagnosis quite extensively, some, some, some really excellent doctors that I trained with in Belgium. Okay. So, you know, I had a real advantage, I believe, having gone to such a medical school that had an integrative functional approach. They didn't just look at classical in Europe, they also look at homeopathy and a lot of other ways of treating. Mm -hmm. But the main thing that got me into functional medicine was when I started seeing these patients and I realized that classical medicine could only take me so far. I could only get my patients better to a certain point. I had to start to look at other areas of how I could get my patients better. And that's what really started me in the journey of looking at heavy metals and mold toxins and detoxification and the microbiome of the gut. Um, you know, all of the things that functional medicine doctors look at. And I can tell you after doing this now for decades, 
that without doing functional medicine, if you are a physician treating patients or especially chronically ill patients out there, you're never gonna get the same kind of results because as good as classical medicine is, uh, it, it's just missing certain essential areas that you cannot get to unless you're doing functional medicine. Okay, okay. And what advice do you have for um, recent medical graduates entering into, you know, they're gonna be going into their residencies? The, the most important advice I got from one of my Tibetan teachers, I had started studying meditation and Tibetan Buddhism back in 1981 when I was in Belgium. Um, I, I've been a Tibetan Buddhist now for the last 40 years. And um, when I studied with these great enlightened masters, I was very fortunate to study with some really wonderful teachers from the Kagyu lineage. Lama Gendon Rinpoche, when I was get, leaving medical school, I said to him, Lama, what is the most important thing you want me to know as a physician mm -hmm. before I go out in the world? Mm -hmm. And he said, Richard, the most important thing is exchange yourself with others and do for others what you would want to do for yourself. So mm -hmm. in other words, if someone is sick and they're not getting better from a treatment, and you know, usually as a primary care physician or internist, you're taught to like send them over to consult with neurologists mm -hmm. and infectious disease and cardiology, and there's nothing wrong with that. But in Lyme disease specifically, a lot of these subspecialties are not keeping up essentially with how fast the medical literature is evolving. Okay. So what I did is I basically put myself in people's shoes and I started looking at what are these solutions. So if a doctor was coming out these days, I would suggest reading my books, why can I get better? How can I get better? Because it is talks about functional medicine mm -hmm. and how you integrate functional medicine into a classical medicine framework. It also talks about Lyme and tick-borne, which there's no way in the world they're going to avoid seeing these patients with chronic tick-borne. And in medical school, you know, they're still looking at the IDSA guidelines. I don't even know if they're, they're saying that there are two guidelines at this point, ILADS and IDSA. So the medical schools still have a while to catch up with these emerging areas like tick-borne illness. Mm -hmm. So I would suggest learning functional medicine, learning about tick-borne. I think if you do that, and you use the proper motivation of what the Tibetans would call bodhicitta, mm -hmm. working for the benefit of others to relieve their suffering mm -hmm. um, and bring happiness to others. I think if you integrate those precepts, you will definitely notice that you're going to be much more effective as a physician in the world. Excellent. Okay. Yeah, thank you. That's great. Advice. Would you say that that has helped you get through the challenges of the last couple of years with COVID? not even a question. And, you know, the beauty about having been a functional medicine doctor with Lyme is that back when COVID started coming out in February, 2020, I published the first article in the global medical literature on glutathione therapy for COVID. And it's been cited over 350 times in other medical journals with an article that I published in April, 2020 um, in the journal of clinical uh, respiratory medicine case reports. If you look it up, you'll find it. And how did I know to use glutathione in COVID? Well, when I looked at the inflammatory cytokines that come out with COVID, because the reason people get sick from COVID is from a huge cytokine storm, from inflammation. When I looked at those inflammatory cytokines, they were the same inflammatory cytokines I've been treating in Lyme patients for the last 30 plus years. Oh, okay. So I used things like NAC, alpha lipoic acid, and glutathione, which block a switch inside the nucleus called NF-kappa B. It turns out that when you block NF-kappa B, that's the main switch that COVID uses to turn on these inflammatory cytokines. I then lowered another inflammatory pathway by stimulating a pathway called NRF2. How do you do that? Well, that's turmeric, curcumin, broccoli seed extract, sulforaphane glucosinolate, resveratrol, and green tea extract. I block a third pathway called the NLRP3 inflammasomes using a small dose of melatonin. So if you look at the inflammatory pathways, which I learned from treating Lyme disease, and I then applied it towards COVID-19, we have not had one patient die in my medical practice in the last two and a half years. I've only seen two patients in my practice who've been hospitalized. And we do not have COVID long haulers in general in my practice because we treated them early on by blocking the inflammatory response. Hmm. Now, before Paxlovid was available as a five-day course, I was using ivermectin, 0.2 milligrams per kilo for 14 days. And I had excellent results. And there's a lot of medical literature that ivermectin is effective if you put aside the medical politics that happened with this drug early on. 
So Lyme disease essentially taught me how to deal with COVID-19. And I feel very fortunate, truthfully, that here's a pandemic that happened. And I was able to help protect my patients just by taking what I learned from Lyme disease and applying it to a completely yeah. different disease. That's amazing. It is. But it's amazing. Uh, now, the protocol that you use, is that being used by other healthcare professionals to treat COVID or? Yes, it is. Okay. And, and for people that want to find it, and they should just check with their healthcare provider before doing it, you can find the entire protocol on my medical website. I have two websites. The medical website is www.all one word can get better.com. Right? My first book is Why Can't I Get Better? My second book is How Can I Get Better? The medical website is cangetbetter.com. If you look on the website and you look under the COVID tab, you'll notice that on the second, uh, you'll see there are several blogs. Look at the one that says prevention and treatment for COVID. We have two randomized trials that are also on the website, one of which will be starting soon at the University of California, Irvine for long haulers using the 16-point MSIDS model that I use in Lyme and looking at the role of glutathione in long haulers. So we have been approved. It's on clinicaltrials.gov. It's an approved clinical trial. I just need the FDA at this point to give me an IND, an investigation, a new drug application for glutathione. I'm going back and forth with the FDA now, but hopefully this year, I will have a clinical trial. I'm using the Lyme treatment regimens we've used for long haulers and seeing if it's effective. Excellent. Okay. Okay. And yeah, I think it, it answers our next question is, which was how can our listeners learn more about you and your practice? So um, thank you for that. So the yeah. Can Get Better website is great. The other website I have, if you'd like to learn about the climate and Lyme disease and what's happening with the climate, the other website is www.starseed-revolution.com. What happened is about four years ago, the kids, after they were getting over Lyme disease by using double dose dapsone combination therapy, they were coming in with climate grief. And I would say to them after they were well, what are you going to do with your life now that you're better from Lyme? Mm -hmm. And they would uniformly say to me, nothing. And mm -hmm. I would say, what do you mean nothing? I said, you're better. You're going to go to college. You're going to get a job. And they said, no. And I said, why? They said, well, the world is going to end. Why should I bother going to college and get a job? Now, this started happening with such frequency about four years ago, and I didn't really know about climate grief at the time. I started diving into the climate scientific literature to find out what these kids were seeing. Mm -hmm. And I realized that they were right, that the world was in big trouble. So I went into meditation and I prayed to my spiritual teachers and I said, what do you want me to do for these kids with climate grief? How can I help them? Mm -hmm. And in meditation, I heard, write a book, to which I responded in meditation, why would I possibly write a book on the climate as a Lyme doctor? Who would even mm -hmm. want to read such a thing? And they said, no, no, no. We want you to write a science fiction climate change book to reach these kids. To which in meditation, I responded, you want me to do what? And they said, yes, and make it funny. So I said, all right, to be clear and understand in meditation, I, you know, I hear things in meditation, but I don't always act them in this way. Mm -hmm. I said, you want me to write a humorous science fiction climate change novel, which explains the problems with the climate and solutions that are not being discussed in the mainstream literature. And that is how Starseed Revolution, The Awakening came about. It was released in March of this year. Um, it, it was published through Permuted Press. And uh, my patients who've read it said it's one of the funniest things they've ever read. And it does give climate solutions that are not being discussed in the mainstream literature. So I'm um, at this point, you know, hoping to get the word out and get a voice in the climate because things like the Thwaites Glacier, for example, in West Antarctica, yeah. that is now holding on, the ice shelf looked like it's going to crack in the next three to five years, yeah. according to scientists. Right. If that Thwaites Glacier, which is the size of Florida, goes into the ocean, we're going to see global sea levels rise by two to three feet, which means New York, Boston, Miami, Bangladesh, uh, all of these global cities across the globe are going to be underwater. Um, we're in big trouble. So it's like, okay, I needed to do something to get the word out, but do it in a way that people weren't going to cry and have grief, laugh, learn about the solutions. And, and that's basically how this came about. And you can learn more on the website, starseed-revolution.com. I have a new friend. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm blown away. Yep. Wow, well, wow. Dr. Horowitz, thank you so, so much for joining our show today. 
Oh, um, it's my it's my pleasure. Keep up the good work. You're really doing great work. And this type of a podcast, by the way, that discusses different diagnoses and, and ways to do this, it's important because I don't think the vast majority of the public is aware of these problems. And it's right. it's great to really raise awareness on it. So thank Absolutely. you for doing it. Thank you so yeah. much. You. And I have a weird question. Oh. Um, have you read any of Octavia Butler's books? Why do I know Octavia Butler? Very famous um, woman that wrote sci-fi, like starting in the 1970s. But- um, You know, I know the name. I don't yeah. I don't think I have read her work. When okay. I was young, mm -hmm. I was very fortunate because I was around um, a, a naturalist, Roger Karras, who had people like Arthur C. Clarke at his house in the Hamptons. So I met some of these sci-fi greats when mm -hmm. I was like nine years old mm -hmm. and got to like learn about Stanley Kubrick and Arthur C. Clarke and Heinlein. So, I was exposed to this as a young child, and I used to read sci-fi and comic books, which is kind of how I got into this superhero mode of, wow. I'm here to save the world. I'm, <laughs> I'm saving the world from Lyme. I'm saving the world from climate change. I'm yes, saving the world from COVID. Sure. It's like I love how it. I got this like superhero mentality. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I love it. I, no, I don't know. I'll have to look her up. I know okay. the name, but I've not looked her up. But okay. thank you for sharing. Okay. All right. Thank you. Well, you have a wonderful day, sir. Thank you for taking the time. We really, really appreciate it. My pleasure. Have a great day. You too. You as bye well. Bye. Bye bye. So to all of our listeners, thank you so much for joining us today. And we hope you are staying as healthy as possible. Yes. Thank you for listening. And please don't forget to schedule that annual checkup. Or a routine checkup if you're young. Great. Okay. If you have any questions or comments related to today's show, please drop us a line at podcastdx at yahoo.com. Visit our website, podcastdx.com. And please remember to like and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, TikTok, and Instagram. And if you have a moment to spare, please go ahead and give us a review. As always, please keep in mind that this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. This is a podcast, and we are not healthcare providers. Your health and wellness are important, and we want you to know that we care about you. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified healthcare provider with any questions you or concerns you may have regarding a medical condition or treatment and before undertaking a new healthcare regime. And never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something you have heard on this podcast. Till next week.